So all I can say is that the, uh, although we have set pieces, uh, the program does expect and allow for discussion and there is no objection to people putting a strong point of view, even if it seems uh, to be against the tone of, of the generality of speakers. The whole point is to try and engage with some polemic. Right, well now if I could just go quickly back over yesterday for those of you who weren't here. We started with Will Alsop. Although he's an architect by training, he, reject, he rejects the standard role of the architect and in fact he gave us what I might say was a classic case for the freedom of the artist insisting that there shall be no manifesto and then proceeding to give us his manifesto, insisting that the last thing we want is definitions and then proceeding to give us, as an artist must, his examples, which like the English spoken in front of children, turns out to be sufficient to allow us to infer what the language is. And finally, he insisted that there should be no framework or rules and proceeded to show us examples that were gridded as Colin Rowe pointed out, so that they seem to have a schematic framework uh, uh, within them and to, be, and to consist of events structured within a framework. Now, out of all that could arise, in fact, kind of obvious scope for discussion. Um, what we have here is possibly to be described as a set of paradoxes rather than contradictions whatever weakness one might feel the artist uh, uh, just demonstrates in claiming one thing and then having to structure his response so as to be intelligible. This is, not, this is not a contradiction which we can dismiss as nonsense. It's inherent in the paradox, I think, of the whole form content dilemma. We mustn't dismiss this. Uh, we have to assess the value of a point of view like Will's, I think, from our hidden or tacit understanding of his commitment to a struggle for freedom. That is what I think gives value to the, to the uh, presentation. Nevertheless, there were certain obvious difficulties, particularly as in his sketch of uh, conceptual situations rather than artifacts, he delineated a process in which the client had a definite role, the client or user, uh, in fact, his prescription arose out of an idea that the artist should not complete objects, but should set up some kind of framework within which users or clients can complete. And this raised certain questions about who was going to uh, take on that role. Could this ever be uh, anything but a learned role in the special sense in which his students at the St. Martin School can learn for an hour, for a week, for a day, to assume the style of freedom. Could one get beyond style? Now, those questions seem to me to be absolutely central to the idea of conceptual art. And they are, they are concerned, in my view, with the idea of a refusal, a refusal by the artist of certain constraints. And this is analogous to the refusal by the revolutionary of certain constraints. Uh, it, it does raise philosophical problems about whether there can ever be life without constraints. I, I, I myself always have these difficulties. Colin Rowe, clearly in his reaction, has these difficulties. But, uh, but to raise these difficulties doesn't kill the question about how this refusal can be given meaning. And as I pointed out in my earlier introduction, white on white is a refusal in a sequence, in a certain sequence. We don't need to go into repeated typologies of white and white, and I forget the name of the artist that got some way with black on black, and presumably we've got blue on blue with, uh, what's his name, not Shine or Scheidt or something, the, the, the single blue canvas. But um, problems of the formal <coughs> context by which all refusals are refused, that is to say the refusal is defused, is part of the ongoing institutionalizing of society. And we must expect that to happen. It happens between the artist and society as a whole, so that he is forced to search for a meaningful role, possibly in small groups. And it even happens within the very small 
specialized group that is studying conceptual art where the refusal is hurled back as an insult. Now, all these issues, I think, were rather lost sight of in the subsequent discussions, although I feel that Charles Jenks performed a very useful uh, function in giving us a quick sketch through the centuries of moments of conceptual content in art. He didn't give us a history of conceptual art, but he, he pointed to a few tendencies or, or um, um, possibilities which had emerged above the, the general surface of art in history, starting with Plato's ideality, which could never exist, could never be matched up to by the actuality, and thereby, in a way, setting off right beginning of Western art an impossible paradox between ideal and actual, and that certainly is part of our tradition. And then going on through the Baroque concetto, the conceit, the conceit whereby uh, a story is enacted or embodied in sculpture, in painting, in such a way as to prescribe a kind of response in life. Uh, the Counter Reformation, of course, was aiming to be prescriptive and to re uh, to to encourage participation by everyone in the mysteries of religion. In order for that to happen, the Jesuits were prepared to allow a fantastic degree of sensuality to enter art. And Charles read out Saint Teresa's description of her. Uh, re reception of the spear from the angel with art pointing to its obvious uh, modern uh, undertones. Uh, art, therefore, has at certain moments in our history been able to say things without explicitly claiming that it is saying them. This is very important, I think, that there have been tacit contents of art which were not part of the official picture, as it were, at the time. And this, of course, leads us to the modern quest for tacit structures, for hidden, hidden tendencies which, in a psychological and social sense, structure the kind of things that artists can say, and thereby lead us into the reflexive knowledge, the knowledge of our roles, which I think is what bugs the artist trying to escape from institutions. And uh, Charles gave us his examples this incredible actual building by Japanese of, uh, of ideas, something to do, I suppose, with reinforced concrete and Buddhism, an incredible materialization of, image, of impossible ideas, uh, the big box and so on. I think we found these stimulating, while in a way feeling that uh, they, they led us away from the metaphysical discussion. In the afternoon, we had two further examples by artists who happened to be architects. First of all, Peter Cook. And I enjoyed his talk, particularly because he started from a story of an encounter, the tutor and the student. The student, in this case, refusing a framework, refusing the very liberal framework that was offered him, searching for reasons for rejecting a very open and liberal framework. And all the degrees of um, uh, stance that this search involved. And uh, in the case, a case of a particular student who in the end rejected visual presentation, and as I pointed out, has since gone into uh, uh, re historical research and politics, um, we can see that this evasion of the set piece presentation which the schools demand doesn't have to be simply evasion, it can simply be uh, a wish for another mode of action. So, although that history of the individual allowed us to see how uh, a certain framework had to be refused, it leaves open the paradox about how that framework could be refused and accepted together, how one could accept the presentation mode, the jury system, the idea that there would be a show at the end of term and still do something that refused the framework that was offered, which I think is the, is the central issue. Um, Peter did also go through a number of qualities which he had seen in these refined stances in the course of further years of dealing with them. And I think the points that struck me were, on the one hand, the aim to dematerialize, to, in a sense, get out from under the heavy, the heavy load, 
uh, so that what is offered is itself airy, if not fairy, and that it can never be tentative and search out directions which couldn't be thumped, uh, thumped, in, thumped in. And secondly, that there is a moral stance here. There is a moral fiber running through the stance, whether it is Puritanism or, as he suggested, the guilt of the Puritan artist who uh, um, cannot somehow accept that his game should just be a, an effervescent game, that he should be sensual or whatever, and die, just throw it on the waters, but somehow has to structure himself into a receiving, receiver's uh, position to have an audience, to have a client, as we saw with Will. Uh, the, the conclusion of Peter's uh, argument was that we see here three fields of architecture. Um, this very evanescent immaterial end, and over there, the great thumpy establishment end, which could include very sharp buildings, but essentially things are to be built and used. And in the middle, a middle ground, um, or at any rate, a third field, which was in a sense uh, partly dematerialized. He called it knitting, and I think this must refer I can make my interpretation of his, uh, the use of drafting and scripting techniques, which his, his group has worked on over the years, to project scenarios, which include possible buildings, but in a sense, not yet existing situations. Uh, he then went on to hope that a fourth class could arise, and I confess at that point I lost him. I couldn't see the fourth point simply as another, another tin off the shelf, but my own way of looking at things always drives them into paradoxes and dualities. And to me, the difficulty is that I can place three things in a line, uh, middle, beginning, and end, and so on, but I can't easily see the fourth. Why the fourth? Why not a fifth? Uh, so I probably misinterpreted Peter when I said that the, the fourth is coming up from the even more immaterial <coughs> end. I don't know. This is something which I think should be clarified, I hope will be clarified in the discussions. But I think most of us felt unsatisfied with Peter's brief, uh, brief um, pie in the sky of a, a, a kind of architecture which was neither those things we'd heard about but something else. We didn't really get a chance to work out what that was. And the same really applies to the last speaker, Peter Eisenman, who gave us an example of his, one of his houses, number eight in the sequence, eight, eight six, sorry, six in the sequence, from his point of view, a logical development from what he did in House 5, House 4, and so on, um, so hermetic and deliberately hermetic as to be very difficult to become involved in um, the geometry and the topology of the division of a cube is something which could uh, quite clearly have a distinct mathematical base. But one didn't understand what were the mathematical axia uh, which were being uh, manipulated here beyond some idea that in the complexity would, would exist a higher level simplicity which was to do with the symmetry along the diagonal cut, the diagonal axis of the volume. And the most appealing thing here, I think, was the emergence of the second staircase, the actual staircase used to go to bed and the virtual staircase, nevertheless actually constructed, descending in a counter direction to complete that geometry. Peter's claim, I think, is that by actually constructing a virtual staircase, as it were, he does give an example of mental architecture, of architecture which is not simply humdrum, in which the client will not simply hang his coat over the, the column, as it were, but will actually start thinking about it. And the, the, the central experience which is offered in Peter's house is one of learning from the artifact. The artifact create sensations A, perhaps rather picturesque, perhaps rather rich. Um, an examination reveals something like rules, something like a structure. Uh, this is studied, an understanding is reached, which involves projecting oneself out of one's, one's uh, host's dinner party into a position from which the house suddenly becomes an exonometric. <coughs> then having seen it as an exonometric and understood it, you come back in and complete the dinner with full understanding, or at any rate with a new experience of the house. Now, um, I think many of us felt that this deliberately hermetic sequence uh, uh, was somehow or other not what the mainstream of conceptual art was about. Uh, mainstream of conceptual art is involved with a refusal. Could one say that Peter Eisenman's refusal 
of, uh, of a key to the game, leaving it all to your private initiative, as it were, could one say that this was part of the same idea of moral responsibility and refusal of society and so on? Uh, perhaps I'm putting political content into the idea of conceptual art, which is not there. I think Peter would claim that it needn't be there or shouldn't be there. Uh, at any rate, um, we were left with the situation that whatever meaning Peter attaches to his hermetic structures, he's not able to stop us saying, ha ha, that goes back to Van Dersburg, ha ha, that's a part of this uh, uh, right-wing formalism that we've seen so much of in the States recently, American uh, uh, architects trying hard to be artists and showing that they've got a cultural heritage, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And uh, I think in a way Peter even invites that because after all he's got a very big pipe and he can wear tweeds as well as any Englishman and he's sort of uh, invulnerable in that sense. Now that's the story of what happened in my view, that's how I understand it, I may be all up the pole and if I've said it wrong that gives you where I've said it wrong. Uh, uh, a possibility of correcting and starting us again. Uh, what I would like, though, just to finish this uh, introduction, to say is that we can't preempt what the speakers are going to say. The speakers have been chosen by Peter Cook uh, out of some sense of what they might say, but not really knowing what they're going to come up with. The whole thing is experimental in a degree, and um, we have to take the mix as it comes. We have to see what the hell they say. I mean. How do we know to what extent the gorillas yesterday may have modified what Cedric's going to say now? This is very much a happening. So don't get the idea that it's all a, a manipulatory thing just because Dennis Crompton's putting it on tape. It's not something to do with Lord Goodman. It's to do with a discussion about art issues. And um, what I hope the discussion will do today, and especially since we have Bernard uh, offering us his theory, I hope, this morning, is to bring it back to this idea of the extent to which art uh, must be captured by society, the extent to which it can be a gesture which refuses a state of society, and in that way somehow, possibly, practically helps to bring about a different state of society. This is how I would view it. Uh, that could be given as a program for any uh, any experimental or radical art. How conceptual art in particular does this is what we want to find out today. How its immaterial uh, ideational approach, the sense in which it somehow relates art to a situation rather than to a thing. This is what we have to explore. It's not my duty at this moment to try and say what it is. I've said enough to show you uh, my own interest in it and we must leave that to emerge from the discussion. And then first we have then that well-known gorilla, Cedric Price. Thank you. <clears throat> in fact, my lunch, <laughs> what well, nearest thing to it. I don't, while I'm putting my cards up, I don't, uh, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure. I'm, I, uh, two things Bob said. Oh, one thing, Mr. Chairman. I think it is useful if we, if we give people surnames because of various Peters and Stans and Cedrics and things. And I'm sure that a uh, large number of the audience uh, would find it more useful. Uh, second thing is I don't really see why uh, Although it's, it's a very good thing, and we, we all, I think, felt that last yesterday of one of the speakers. Uh, why, uh, you say, the artists should be purer. We'd probably introduce a more pure thing. Well, that, that, may, that may be true, but the, the subject of these two days is uh, conceptual architecture. And I, for one, do not see why that has to be pure. I don't uh, quite get that, but it may be your puritanism, Mr. Chairman, that I've missed out on that. Well, you did. That's all right. There's no grumble. Just curious.
<laughs> Where is the shelf on this thing? Around the other side, actually. That's a good concept. <coughs> Now, um, Rosalie Goldberg, through her summary yesterday of what had been said, made it a lot easier for me today, today to say almost anything, as I had been worried, because I'd been losing the thread as to what was uh, worth discussing and what was merely uh, some uh, dictionary attention to conceptual architecture. However, prior to that, I had looked up in the dictionary various words, because I always find that useful. And um, if I can find them, I'll just point out one or two things. This is, um, yes, uh, it's Charles Jenks. Yeah. Oh, good gracious, good morning. Hello, oh, very nice to see you. Um, I, I, I liked your <coughs> definition of, of uh, conception, which I'm sure is out of dictionary, but I like the one which was to become pregnant with. See, and I think that's a very good idea. If you actually add it to another definition, <laughs> this is ridiculous. Sorry, we have to wait till we get it right. Oh, they, yes, that's right, you see, to become pregnant with. I mean, I think the best definition is the one that you pinched, I mean, which I was going to pinch, which is Duchamp's one. I mean, that's one I like, which is the machine, you know, for making art. Um, but the Oxford Dictionary one is quite interesting, which is a general notion, full stop. Concept, general notion. Right, I like that one as well. And therefore, I would take, uh, take you to task on, on saying that in that one drawing by Call, there were at least seven, you know, the RC building, there were at least seven concepts. I think there was one, and that was the drawing. <laughs> I think the others might have been, might have been uh, tools, language, or ideas, but not concept. The uh, discussion on, uh, that the appeared to be, which puzzled me, I mean, this morning, I'd I know I'm starting a little bit late, but there are some things that have puzzled me because they don't, uh, I find, um, to be anything more than, than uh, grumbles. That is, I never found anything worth discussing if it's pure, purely to sort of compare grumbles. I think things worth discussing, such as the subject for this two days, is that we might um, in some way become more useful as a result of the discussion. But then that might be my Puritanism, or at least my utility attitude to things. Which wasn't a concept, actually. Utility furniture and utility design was not a concept, but it's being looked as one now, 30 years afterwards. However, uh, I don't think there is um, <clears throat> a theory versus competence um, discussion of any value at all. But I do think that there may be um, a scholarship uh, a scholarship in comparison with wisdom discussion, which fortunately I have a quotation from, now I pronounce him Kant, but Stan, you pronounced his name another way yesterday. Anyhow, Kant, Dreams of a Ghost Seer. To yield to every whim of curiosity and to allow our passion for inquiry to be restrained by nothing but the limits of our ability, this shows an eagerness of mind not unbecoming to scholarship. Very nice definition of scholarship. But it is wisdom that has the merit of selecting from among the innumerable problems which present themselves those whose solution is important to mankind. Now that is a little better than competence. Um, the uh, question uh, of discussion about uh, 
there were, there were builders, or there was buildings architecture, and then there was architecture architecture, and there was that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I, I would prefer to think of uh, architecture as the vehicle of what one is trying to do, but only as the vehicle, not as the driver, not as a passenger, but architecture as a vehicle, not buildings as the vehicle. The Oxford Dictionary, back to the Oxford Dictionary one on the general concept being a general notion, uh, what I like about that is its incompleteness. And what I think is important about conceptual architecture, uh, I suppose I'd better go right to the end first, that I can't separate um, the two. I mean, conceptual architecture is all there is for me. I can't uh, think that one day I'll study non-conceptual architecture the next day. I mean, I, I, but this, this, is, this is my limit, not yours. My problem, not yours. Um, I'm not sure whether post-mortem is the good or bad. But I do think that the incompleteness of the idea, if, if that incompleteness can be carried through with the same sincerity, uh, or it might have been greed that it was arrived at in the first place. I mean, greed on time, i.e. that it may be easier to have an incomplete idea than a complete one, i.e. it may take less time. I don't believe this personally, but I think a lot of architects do operate that way. However, whether it was greed or, or super sensitivity, the incompleteness of initial concept, the, the, the difficulty is keeping that incompleteness throughout the system. And it doesn't matter particularly whether you end up with a good bit of, of advice to someone not to build or a building. You, the, the, the architectural element is there because the the range of questioning has been gone through. But if, in fact, you're certain that what you've done, I, either the building or the advice don't build, is the final word, then I think it is suspect. To draw a qualified no is, is tricky, I agree. Um, but I'm trying to go side, sideways to make a point. Um, in the uh, relation to, to uh, conceptual architecture, I think that there is um, a necessity for us, and here I speak of architects, there's a necessity for us to <coughs> extend our first concept to uh, the almost the level of absurdity. Um, uh, for instance, um, Zeno's paradox, the, the, uh, which I will quote, an arrow in flight at any given moment must occupy a space equal to itself. Reasonable. Since no part of it can be in more than one place at the same time. Reasonable. What occupies a space equal to itself must be at rest. Reasonable. So an arrow in flight must be at rest. Daft. Um, now, you might say, ah, oh, but it's a series of separate stages. A series of separate stages. And you say, how do you know? And you say, well, there's um, cinema, frames, it's film, isn't it? Frames, you see. So you say, all right, show me a bit of your film. There's the arrow in one frame, there's the arrow in the other. And you say, great, now, translate that back to reality. And they say, oh, well, um, it's not quite like that. But that was such and such a speed. And I'm sorry, it's not quite like that. There's, um, perhaps I could explain it best by saying that between that frame and that frame, there are an infinite number of images. Hmm, I see. Right, now, how can you ever reach the next picture, the next frame, when an infinite number stands in the way of reaching it? Hmm. 
full stop. The, uh, a house, or well, that it can be seen, you see what modesty early morning talks bring on me. I see the house as an intermittently used commodity, <laughs> with firmness and delight, if you like, having a certain life or speed in relation to any piece of land, just as you can time, you can time your own speed through your life, you can measure how much you've moved, and you know you've lived 60 years, and you can work out your average MPH. So you can on a house, on a particular piece of land. So you can on a family. Uh, therefore, it's very capable of comparison to uh, successively partially filled passenger trains passing one piece of land. It's exactly the same equation can be made. Now, why I'm going on about this is that unless I can get concepts like this, I find it impossible to design. But I also draw a great sneaky strength on a thing Bob referred to yesterday, which was that when you want to look for change, first of all, you look for change in the meaning of language, not actually change in language. You don't actually even look for first new words like, like jeep or cock. <laughs> or whatever, you actually look for a change in the meaning of the old words. Now that is Orwell's point. And an example of this uh, is that <coughs> whereas at a very early stage on a, on a situation, um, I, d I don't take on problems, they, they hurt too much. If someone's got a problem, my reaction to it will probably be too slow anyhow. But uh, situations I might be useful in. Dentists are better with problems. And plumbers. Um, but I've, I've listed some of the jobs over the last few years, some of the titles which I use not merely as a displacement tendency, I mean not, no, not displacement tendency, not merely as a smoke screen, although it is useful so that no one ever knows quite what, <laughs> what you're talking about and they have to use this word as a title, but also because it reminds oneself of the uh, looseness, the incompleteness of the original uh, situation. Um, so if I can just go through, well, if I can, you can always leave. I mean, I am going through. Um, I don't know, it's, it's polite. You said orange juice, I think. I'm used to having orange juice early in the morning. It's all the water. I'll go through them and then I'll tell you what, the, what, what their, their actual dreary self was at the end. Hag hole. That was a weekend transportable holiday home f on the beach for a family called Haig, spelt H-A-G-U-E. That was hag hole. Uh, fun palace. That was a situation where Joan Littlewood came to me and she said, I doubt whether it needs a building, but will you have a look at it? This is what I want to do. If we want to discuss the, which I'd like to, but probably in discussion, my views that you asked while I was getting blacked up for the monkey act, um, on the big box. Uh, we can come on later, because I think that's a <laughs> travesty of, of, I mean, I think it's a disgraceful way to handle human beings, that big box. Thanks. Uh, sea garden. Nothing more than a floating breakwater. Olympia Brain, nothing more than a communication system in the Olympic Village. Atom, uh, a new town, the majority of whose uh, working population would be working in advanced physics. Truck Safe, a high security car park. Fun City, a pot festival. Manfest, uh, something to do with the Manchester Festival. But if you put Manfest, <laughs> right, 24-hour um, living toy, a system of house plans, non-plan, anything but. Uh, I mean, it wasn't non-plan, it was null plan, but non-plan was, was what one had to remind oneself one would have liked to have said. For those who are not conversant with it, too bad. Uh, think belt. A semi-mobile, short-term industrial university. <coughs> Echoes, a series of office buildings. 
Um, and echoes in two ways was used. One as that word, the other as um, heading environment controlled human operational enclosed spaces. But it took quite a bit getting it in. Uh, Kentish Town West Amalgam. Now Kentish Town West is a railway station, not a postal area. Uh, amalgam, Kentish Town West Amalgam, all that is is a short term community centre. The um, element in uh, those, <coughs> which I don't think has been brought out up to now, which I think very important, is, is, is the time element, is the fourth dimension, which I find the key element to the decision whether, in <coughs> fact, one can be useful or not. Remembering, as I say, as far as I'm concerned, architecture is the vehicle, that's all. The uh, time element uh, is in some way I hope, related to being generous. You know, it's, in the first case, I suppose it's generous to oneself, although that is, I hope, not always right. But the time element, the importance of time, which is what, in fact, that, that book by, you know, that, that's the nicest thing I get from the book by um, Bergen, is the speed at which one can read it. Not because you can read it fast or slow, but, but you, can, you can use that book at different intervals, the, the, the desk sequence. Uh, but primarily, the, um, being useful is, 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 is primarily trying to be humane. It's, it's making things, is really making things better. And whether one agrees or not on whether the increase of choice or the reduction of choice, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is making things better. From my point of view, in relation to conceptual architecture, the more that is left to the more humanely acute, the, the nicer tuned, i.e. more accurately tuned social responses against uh, greed, unfairness, horror, and wickedness of all sorts, the more that is left for the finer tuners to take over through the architecture being less demanding, and I don't just mean in a visual sense, the better. In fact, I mean in a visual sense in a very small way, but the big box gets me. <laughs> um, but I absolutely agree with, with Colin Rowe, which actually does happen often, that uh, life can never become a game. It may be because it's too short, but uh, I do agree with him. The I don't have particular objections to definitions, though I do, um, I, find, <laughs> I find rules rather boring unless everyone has the same pack of cards and the same set of rules and anyone can call for a new pack at any time. Then perhaps I like rules, but I don't mind definitions. I think the reason for architecture, the reason for it, is to encourage, rather than satisfy, people's appetites to behave mentally and physically in ways which they had previously thought impossible. And that architecture can best be judged by the untruths it establishes in other disciplines. And therefore, <clears throat> what I do is aimed at achieving the social engineering of the first statement by means of actions implicit in the second. Now, I read that out because I wrote it a short time ago, and when I read it out last time, someone said, what do you mean, uh, the architect would best be judged by untruths is established in other disciplines? Surely that is, that is, that is, you know, that is nihil, nihilism. <laughs> I always look up their pronunciation, don't worry. Um, 
So I, I wrote out two answers to that question, but I've got an even better one today. At, uh, I think I did. Yeah. One, I point out the building of better schools does not improve people's appetite to learn, but it does increase the convenience of dispensers of education. But if you want to improve people's appetites to learn for us, one reason or another, then building of schools has nothing to do with it. Um, another obvious one, the provision of more hospitals has no effect on reducing the incidence of human accidents. Uh, and one that I don't know the answer to, but happened on Thursday, that the Transport and General Workers Union and Pickford's Transport <coughs> got together and have formed the largest uh, packaged holiday firm in the country overnight, because Transport and General Workers Union have two million members plus family. And this is to give packaged holidays which won't go wrong. Now, in fact, you see, but, it, but just imagine if an architect had been asked to do that. How do, you, how do you design that two weeks out of 52 weeks, two million people will have a period of free will time without fear or disappointment? Because that's what's been achieved by that unit. And that's a concept. There was uh, a crummy sort of period of conversation yesterday about um, <laughs> leading people through things and, and um, the delight they would get once they discovered the game that was being played, et cetera, et cetera. I, I find that uh, a little bit rum. I, I think that uh, what one... Um, often finds one is doing is, is, uh, is calculated uh, deceit and unnatural distortion. There's nothing, nothing more unnatural than architecture. There's nothing particularly natural about it. Um, I'm not sure why, in fact, the hidden tendencies or, or the game has to be learnt or the secret come out. I, th I, 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 I find that a strange, though, though it be a concept, I suppose, I find it a bit rum. Um, <coughs> have we got any quotes left, please? Oh, Heraclitus, Heraclitus, good one. You cannot step into the same river twice. Sure. Trying to keep on the time. I meant to finish it today. Yeah, I think I've said all I want to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's right, it wasn't. When they were building it, it wasn't a concept. Now that it's in a museum, and seeing as utility furniture it seems to be a concept. Yeah. Yeah. But what about, you said that the transport workers that was a concept, free, more free holiday. So was it? Now, I said it is. 
I'm not yeah. sure whether they recognized it as such. But, oh, you mean Ukrainian consciousness in the making? I, well, I was saying redefined, in the way I redefined it, that seems a concept to me. I don't think they said, hey, I've got a concept. But I mean, I think, no, but I think that's, no, I think it's a good point, because the thing is that if, uh, if a concept is, is the Oxford Dictionary one, then, then it can be recognized at that at any time, not necessarily at the inception. You see, because, because if it's that loose, <laughs> you should have been here. Ah, yes, the general notion, the concept, general notion, Oxford Dictionary. If it's recognized as that, as a tool at any time, then I, I think that's valid. And then one can draw definitions of conceptual architecture. It may happen at the start, not necessarily. When, are you really quite sure that I mean, it wasn't uh, utility furniture, so it wasn't a concept at the time? Quite sure, yes. Yeah. From the history of it, I know. Yes, yeah. It was, it was, even, it was even more, more mundane, bumbling approach than the other thing I quoted. Yeah. I'm not quite sure I followed totally your line of thought, but isn't the, the uh, union workers that concept, isn't that really problem solving? Wouldn't it certainly be more problem solving than it would be architecture? And by your definition of, of there is no such thing as non conceptual architecture, all architectural is conceptual. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think, I, well, uh, it, it's, it's, um, I, I think that, I don't think that it's a, a problem. It, it isn't as if that they're saying they will not have, they, there is not, and God knows it isn't enough, but there is not two weeks a year free will time available to our people. No one said that. That would be a problem if there wasn't any free will time. It isn't that. It's, it's, it's an overlay. It isn't a problem. It's, 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 it's a concept that during that period of free will time, something which is, is classed as a, as, as a holiday now, i.e. you go abroad, a foreign holiday, could be better classed as a period during that time where, you, where your choice is extended without, without fear or disappointment. But it's, that isn't a problem. That's the solution to the problem. No, but it's, what's the problem? There isn't a problem. You don't have to go on holiday. I mean, you know, all right, you can say, you know, do I have cheese or fruit for the third course of the meal? I mean, you could define that as a problem, but I mean, I don't think that it's... I, I, I just don't like the word. I think that's all. Because I think, I think the trouble is, if you use the word, in, if architects keep thinking they're problem solvers, then they'll think that everyone has to come to them with a long face, and if they do anything, they'll expect them to smile when they give it back to them, because they've solved it. What, infinity over 2 minus 1? No. Well, that, that is a finite number because you can do a series. Nevertheless, I think you might have done it a bit more harm than we could today because um, you criticized <laughs> of what was happening yesterday, which I myself thought whether it's in fact within the terms of reference. Grasping of a meaning within the object by the subject seems to be a worthy concept to talk about. 
It, it, it may be a worthy concept, but it isn't, it isn't necessarily a universally agreed concept. So I haven't done any damage to his concept. I just, I didn't actually agree that this is, this is a universal need for that oneness. Provided in it, it isn't um, sort of throttled. Oh, I, no, I don't, I, I won't throttle. You can't throttle those people out there, no. No, no, I, okay, we made, you made a good point. I still don't quite know how you can say that, that I, I'd like to hear your bit about infinity again, though. Well, I'm not trying, I mean, because it makes a nonsense of the word. It's the drinking of what's left in a cup. Yeah. You never end. Mm. You do end because of the, the infinite series through the simple um, calculus gives you a, a figure of one. <laughs> no, it gives you an integer. No, that's what I was saying. That you can, you can define, you can measure infinity. You put it infinity so over infinity. two minus one you're starting a series, because then you can have infinity over 2 minus 2. And you can build a series, and you have a constant, which in fact means that the, if the constant is part of that, it is a measurable unit. But it still can't be measured. Otherwise, it makes a nonsense of the word. So you still actually couldn't get that final frame <laughs> with the arrow. An infinite series can total up to a finite number. That's all I'm saying. Well, OK. <laughs> yes, no, no, perhaps it could, but I mean, that, what I was, why I quoted the, the uh, Zeno's paradox is that, is that it was what I said one should push one's initial concept to as a testing bed. That's why I quoted that one. Zeno is playing with the, the game of logic, he's not playing with reality, and you said games and lies. No, I didn't. I, I, I wish they were compatible, but I didn't say they were incompatible. I agreed with Colin Rowe saying life is not a game. Yeah. Because they come from that machine. 
Um, America, one felt, would be a situation in which um, the struggle for artifacts would be um, the oppressor. And I found that um, a situation there, which is bound to become more, more so here, is in fact that oppression is not caused by the control of artifacts. Oppression is caused very, very, um, in a very finely tuned way, by the withholding of access to the present. Now, um, what I see as taking place there is the restatement of local history in a marvelously distorted way. Um, American history is seen, in fact, uh, as a dream world of New England, half timbered <coughs> cottages, and an absolutely frozen dream which has no reality. Uh, it, it's, it's used and restated in, in, in this way. The American future is seen as um, better orgasms through the right deodorant. Um, you purchase another artifact, and another sort of dream will be yours immediately. But as soon as anybody struggles towards a direct access with the day-to-day experience of life. The hippies, the dope freaks, whoever tries to make some kind of grab at the day-by-day -day situation, they're seen as a terrible threat. This is the most direct threat to the consumer mechanism. Um, and so what, it, it seems to me that one has to, one has to bear in mind this, this um, the, the use of time and the use of access to time rather than the use of, use of access to more goodies. Which is why oh, yes. I, I, mean, I, I felt that Allsop's thing was terribly traditional, in that the buildings were set around the roots, like all the classic buildings we look at, the Corbusian building, um, delightful or not, as they may or might not be, could be best explained, as Colin Rowe has explained so many of them, with a colored linear overlay just as the lives of their creators were in fact predictable and linear in time. They were processional. Well, I, I think I should let, uh, we'll also come back on that one. I've only got two points, two more. Well, I agree with, with what you say about time. Um, and I just remember two more tummy-turning tummy job titles, where the goodies are exactly the same, but the time factor has been altered. And one is for relocatable dock facilities, but the job is called Dock Ahoy, and the other is for short life airport, but it, the job is called Air Portable. Now, you, you know, all the time, if <coughs> I, I agree, it isn't, it isn't any more goodies that's needed, because they won't change institutions. It's, uh, and it, it often, the point is, it isn't irreverence for time, it's often, often reverence for time, and just how valuable it is. That, that, that should cause this change. But I don't know, Mr. Chairman, if, if Will wants to answer or make, if he wants to make a point. Well, I haven't got much to say, actually, only that uh, I've got no objection to being traditional in any way. <laughs> um, because here we're, we're searching for a sort of truth, really. Um, and therefore that is unrelated to time in every way. In relationship to, I'd like to come back on a couple of points, Cedric. In as far as uh, when you take a strain passing a piece of land, which gives you a specific concept, which allows you to then uh, indulge in some activity mm. uh, in terms of suggestion of um, your problem, um, I think in a way you're you're applying concept to architecture in the same way that uh, that Charles James was actually talking about concepts in architecture as opposed to concept to architecture. Um, and the only point that I really yes, I think that, is that might, we don't on that one. actually yeah. have to to analyse the situation, which is, it it really presents a, a bit of an absurdity as far as the conference is concerned. Mm -hmm. I don't think it should be analysed. I think that the the new architect's role is to get access to to experience and then work in an intuitive way upon that experience of the game. 
Yes, I was just worried that the, the architect is, is too tight at the moment in his own, def, in his own uh, recognizance powers of, of experience. Um, therefore, it was, it was turning back on myself. It was to remind me that, that houses can be measured in miles per hour. Um, and that, admittedly, is just a concept, not conceptual. But um, I think that the, the, the trouble is that, that uh, just to um, increase the range of experience, it, I mean, for instance, there's this, this tribe, uh, this, uh, Gregory quotes it in Eye on the Brain, there's this tribe which no one quite knows why, um, but they will never say that a child resembles the mother. It always resembles the father or it doesn't resemble anyone. Their eyes appear exactly the same as anyone else's eyes. It is not written in any book. <laughs> it's not any religious taboo. He doesn't know why. And I think there are aspects of... <laughs> you can hold on. The things I didn't mention this morning, because it was, I, I'm going on a bit too long. Um, but there the, the are ranges of, of stimulus variables such